Hi, Inez here, and thank you again for joining me on Core Grow Strategies, Positivity and Success Stories. My guest today is all about female empowerment and sharing her big ideas to the world. Learning to let go of her fears and using her failures as a guide, Brown graduate Haley Hoffman Smith is collectively bringing women together and nurturing them to become the best version of themselves. Hi, Haley. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you are quite a busy young lady, I see. I see you've been traveling all over the country. Yes, <laughs> definitely a lot of traveling. Um, yeah, this year, next year for my speaking tour. So it's been super fun. Yeah, so tell me. So you are, you just completed, is this your second book, The Big Ideas? Yeah, this is my second book. Um, so yeah, it's called Her Big Idea. It came out on June 11th. Mm -hmm. and book about like, creativity, ideation, and women's empowerment through entrepreneurship. So it shares the story of my own entrepreneurial experience, shares some stories of other female entrepreneurs, and is really a call to action to pursue your big idea. And it comes up against all of the reasons why people often come up with excuses for why not to, or they feel the fear of it or the failure of it. And so it demystifies a lot of that failure and yeah, really just urges people to go for it. And especially women. Yeah, I mean, definitely, I'm glad to see that there's so many women now that are beginning to support one another, because typically women do kind of like, you know, there's jealousy that gets in, there's backstabbing, there's loyalty, you know, disloyalty, and it's really unfortunate because sometimes you feel that or experience that from people that you consider close to you. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, mm -hmm. Even the book has like a little bit of that just because of something that happened with a co-founder. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of just like a call to be really confident and who you are in your capacity to be an entrepreneur on your own, being really independent. Um, I got into business with somebody because I didn't think I could bring my idea to life alone. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately ended up being a downfall for me. So yeah, there's a lot that you can do on your own. And also supporting other women is the best way to go about it. I collaboration with other women. Um, it was really important to me to feature women in the book, um, launch the book alongside the Her Big Idea Fund. So it mm -hmm. gives grants to women who apply with big ideas. So the whole like central thesis of my life has been supporting women. So, so how, did, how did you get into it? How did you get involved in this? Yeah, so it's a very long story. I'll start at the very beginning. So when I was eight, <laughs> I started a nonprofit called Lit Without Limits. So I was donating books to girls around the world in mentoring groups. I'd write a curriculum to go along with the books. And um, it's my first entrepreneurial experience. I didn't even know I was an entrepreneur. Um, and very quickly spread to Pakistan, the Philippines, all over the United States. And I realized, oh my goodness, like this idea that I had is having this profound impact on these girls' lives. And all it took was like my idea and a little hard work and my devotion to bring that idea to life. And I was so excited about it. Um, I started my first for-profit company and that's the one I went into with the business partner. It was called She's Without Limits. So it was very closely in alignment with the nonprofit. My first book was called She's Without Limits. I wrote it to be kind of like a workbook or a guidebook for the girls that I was donating to. It was going to be the next book. Um, and that was really exciting to launch all of that. Like I was like, entrepreneurship is my thing. <laughs> and, well, we um, actually live in a time period where it's really cool to be an entrepreneur now, which is oh, nice. Yes, definitely. And I was like, I was feeling that for sure. And everything <laughs> was going so well. And we were selling the shirts and the book. And yeah, and it was like all in alignment with the mission of like inspiring women and teaching them that they can obliterate all the limits that they think that they live with, whether they be societal or self-imposed. Um, and things got Harry was the co-founder and she and I just weren't seeing eye to eye. She said, whoever has the money calls the shots. And this is a story that I talk about in my book. Um, so essentially she made the executive decision to dissolve the company, mm -hmm. um, before we could really ever get started past the launch party. And this was really hard for me. I mean, it was the culmination of everything that I had created from the nonprofit to the book to like, when you Googled my name, like she is without limits came up and I had no control over the fact that this company was being dissolved. Mm. And that was really disheartening for me. I mean, it was just like one of the hardest things I've ever, I've ever gone through. And so for a while I was like, I should not touch entrepreneurship with like a 10 foot stick. I'm just going to like sit back, like find another career, go into consulting or something. Mm -hmm. um, but I realized like, you know, I loved starting something and like the, the reasons that I failed weren't like the typical reasons. It's not like this reflects anything on my self-worth nor should failure ever reflect anything on your self-worth. And I decided to start the first ever women's entrepreneurship incubator at Brown. So to help other women bring their ideas to life, 
teach them everything that I wish that I had known, including like the legal side, protecting yourself with an operating agreement, knowing what an LLC is. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that incubator, I started writing my book and my thesis. Then her big idea came out. I launched it with a speaking tour. So I've been speaking um, all of this year at Harvard, Yale, Columbia, SoGal Ventures, Northeastern, CU Boulder. Yeah. And 2019 is about to blow up. I'm like, Woo! <laughs> I want to be on the road. Well, a lot of women of all ages are watching this right now. And they're really, I mean, that's quite inspirational that you were able to quickly take that failure and just kind of rework it in your mind and start something new. And then you kind of like move really quickly with the second <laughs> book. <laughs> I, yeah, I did. I was in a book program, so I, it took me nine months to write it, but I was held really accountable, which I think is good, especially when you're busy, because mm -hmm. it's really easy to be like, oh, I'm writing something, but that's not my deadline. Like, I was in school as a senior in college. Right. Uh -huh. uh, I needed to be held accountable and that was really helpful. And the book was really in alignment with everything that I want to do and represent in the world. So it made it easy to add things on top, like the mm -hmm. speaking tour, like the fund and really make it, you know, my personal brand and my mission in the world. So yeah. How did you go about getting your speaking tours? I mean, that's pretty quick. <laughs> I know. Um, so my book coach was like, I really think that you should like take this message on the road and inspire college students in particular. Mm -hmm. And I was the type of student in high school and throughout college who like was so scared to raise their hand in class or speak. Like I was like, could knock it up in front of people. Even my senior presentation for my thesis, mm -hmm. which was not even a year ago, it was like last May. I was so nervous and all I had to do was like read off something that I had written. Like it's not like I didn't know anything and I was like shaking and so excited for it to be over. Um, so I knew that he was right and I knew that I wanted to do it. Like when I saw myself in my future and my most, most like actualized self, it was me as a speaker yeah. and owning my, myself, my presence, sharing my story, sharing my message. And so I knew if I waited and like waited to write my speech, I would never do it because I didn't have any hold me accountable. It's really hard to write a speech that's like 35 minutes long. Yeah. So I went out there and booked every single gig, just like literally sat down one night, found email addresses of schools, asked people for connections, asked people for introductions for and you. booked every stop. And then it was like, I don't even think I actually put the slides together. This is just like human nature until... <laughs> Oh my God, it wasn't even like a week before the first talk. It was so bad. I'm like, what have I done to myself? But I didn't, I'm kind of like that. I go all in. Uh, and, and that's just further proof. I would have never sat down to write the slides unless I absolutely like had, had to do it. So you yeah. found a way to make yourself accountable. You found yeah. yourself a way to give yourself an, your own deadline because yes. you had somebody else that was like waiting for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, they're banking on me being there, making my travel plans to get there and like they're <laughs> advertising it. So I'm like, I better have the speech done. Yeah, and then like, yeah, it's super uncomfortable. And on a certain level, you're like, I don't want to do this. I'm so nervous and being yeah. nervous is the worst feeling and I still get super nervous, but then you do it and the, the response has been so positive and now I'm like, yes, I knew I was born to do this. I just had to like give myself that push. And I think that's the same for really anybody with their dreams for their lives and their ideas of what they can be and what they want to do in the world. Like mm -hmm. you, sometimes you just need to give yourself that push because yeah. what we want to become or what we feel destined to become is usually on the other side of fear. And a lot of us are going to play it on the safe side. And that's yeah. just the natural thing to do. And I still play it on the safe side in a lot of aspects of my life. It's really hard to do things that scare you. But once you do, and once you push to the other side of that fear, that's when the real magic happens. I can totally relate to you in regards to speaking because believe it or not, I was so deathly shy. And I tell this to my, you know, when I do my speaking engagements now, to the point that I couldn't even get on the phone and order a pizza. I just didn't want it. I, I was in class. I was afraid to speak. I like, I would know the answer, but I was afraid to bring the attention to myself. And my husband, who, you know, we've been together for two decades, but he would laugh and be like, you can't even pick up the phone. Like what's wrong with you? Oh. I'm like, uh, uh. <laughs> I couldn't do it. So the way I found to face my fear was I took acting lessons, no intention of being an actress, but I did it just to like force myself to stand out there in front of people and get, and I use this term all the time, get uncomfortable or excuse me, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And now it's like, who would have thought that now I like make a career out of speaking for the one thing that I feared the most. I've <laughs> actually heard though. It's like something you should ask yourself if you're trying to figure out like what it is that you want to do or what your place is in this world. Like ask yourself, what do you fear the most? Mm -hmm. And then go do that. Like what scares you the most? And for me, that was always speaking. Same for you. Now look at us. I'm in the world speaking. Look at you with your YouTube channel. Could you even call <laughs> pizza? <laughs> oh, I love it. Listen, let me tell you 
something. Um, like you're half my age. So <laughs> the fact that you are like, you figured it out so quickly, you know, kudos to you. That's awesome. And, you know, for everybody, like, you know, there's so many women, um, you know, men too, but there's a lot of young women out there who are not authentic, who are fearful, who are too busy trying to be somebody else that they're not. And they're getting lost. They're just getting lost in the shuffle. No, it's so true. And I really want to, I really want, if anybody hears me speak, that it becomes very much about them rather than about me. Like obviously being up in front of people, it feels very personal, but I want everything that I say to be really self-reflective and, you know, help people realize what their, when I say ideas, like it's not just business ideas. Mm -hmm. It's like ideas for what the life that they want to have. Like, what do you want to create that can be something from like a book? You want to write your own book. You want to do your own screenplay. You want to put your own like photography portfolio on your website, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And kind of like wrap around all the ways that they have said, no, I don't think I can do this or created roadblocks for themselves and be like, well, if you really want to make an impact in this world and to live your life to the fullest, like you either make excuses or you make progress. And so it is very personal about the audience, not about me. And that also makes it easier for me to stand up in front of people and not feel like I'm under a microscope or it is so much about me, like really speak, trying to touch each person in the room as opposed to like impress them or make it about, you know, I mean, it's obviously about my story, but I extend it in a way that's supposed to be relatable to them. Right. And you're, you're so true about the excuses. It's so, it seems like it's a lot easier for people to make excuses and not take accountability. Oh my gosh, way too easy. And I say like the energy that you invest in either making excuses or making progress is mm -hmm. the same. Like you think progress is like, you're going to devote the entire weekend to working on your idea, even though you have to go back to work on Monday. Whereas mm -hmm. an excuses is just like, mm, I'm too busy and I need to do the laundry on Sunday. <laughs> but when you make excuses for yourself and you're procrastinating, like that carries a lot of energy. Like I've been a procrastinator and in a lot of senses, like I still am with certain things. And I know you're not as, then your energy is allocated towards the thing that you're not doing, like regardless. And then it makes it harder for you to be present, to get things done. So making progress can be as small as like emailing a, like a long lost mentor and being like, Hey, I'd really like to talk through my idea. Or who do you know who's in this industry? Like progress can be that small. And then for you of that sense of like procrastination and that you're like, at betraying yourself by not pursuing what you feel compelled to do. And yeah, it's, that's just really important. I was actually talking with somebody on a consulting call yesterday and she was working through some of the questions around her business. And she's like, no, I just feel really stuck because of like X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And from an outsider perspective, I'm like, well, okay, just like set aside the time to research, set aside the time to like find a Facebook group to help you find the right people. And it became all of a sudden really apparent to me, like people create roadblocks because they're scared of the next step. Yeah. Like her problems weren't that big of problems. And this, I see this over and over again, like, no, you can figure this out and it will probably take you 20 minutes. It's just in your head yeah. blown out of proportion to be this like massive roadblock that you can't move forward on. And a lot of it is just self-limiting beliefs and it's identifying what they are, why they were there and learning how to get rid of them. Exactly. A lot of it's just like feeling like, oh, it's like within my capacity to bring the idea to life. I don't know what I'm doing. I've never done this before. Well, like nobody has ever done what they're doing when they're yeah. first starting this before. But people yeah. figure it out. So are you going to be the person who figures it out? Or are you going to be the person who's like, I don't know what to do? Like, we've got Google. Just look it up. <laughs> you can ask right. Me. I mean, we live in like the most amazing time right now with technology. How sure. literally everything is at your fingertips. I mean, you walk around with it now. There's just so much information and accessibility. I mean, wait, like. Years ago, we couldn't be sitting here chatting and having our own little channels and YouTube channels and whatnot and communicating. We wouldn't have met because we got through Instagram. <laughs> what? Yeah. There, there's just so much opportunity out there. And, you know, you mentioned about energy. And I think it's really important to note, too, that, you know, when we have positive energy, more people, positive people want to be around us. And what I have found in my own life is that as I learn to be more positive myself, take accountability, you know, for my own mistakes and for my own setbacks. I have found that I connected with so many other women who, and, and some men too, who are super positive, which we've learned, like we have networked and grown and grown together. Oh, absolutely. I mm -hmm. like the energy is about your energy introduces you 
-hmm. when you walk into the room before you even open your mouth and say anything and same like we live in an age of networking and so you know what it feels like to get on the phone with someone and you're like oh my gosh I would do anything to support them because they just like left me with that sense of enthusiasm or I had such a connecting with them so a lot of that too is like we all have the capacity to have that like infectious charismatic energy like Mm -hmm. the only thing that's keeping us from it is not feeling like we can be all of ourselves like so much what I found resonates with people is that I'm really stepping into trying to be like a hundred percent Haley Hoffman Smith which Mm -hmm. is hard because we all have that of like being seen as we are like if people don't like me that's all I got like I'm all I am you know I can't I'm not gonna like pretend to be someone else that I don't want to be but yeah and that's a really good lesson to learn because, you know, I was, I have a 12 year old or well, 13, just turned 13. And he's going through a little issue right now where, you know, some kids don't like him because he's on the basketball team. He's only been playing for a year. He made a travel team. However, he's not as, you know, skilled as the other kids. And it hurts me to see that they don't embrace him. You know, they, they put him down and, Oh, you suck. And so I have to explain to him, you know what? Mommy goes through this too. Like we all go through this and you have to learn that it doesn't matter what other people think of you. And I keep on reiterating that, you know, the opinions of others do not define who you are. And I think the earlier we learn that the better we will become and more successful will become in every aspect of our lives. Oh, it's so true. And that's a good lesson for him to be learning young, even though it breaks my heart. It's happening. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's what I say. I say, you know what? The, the silver lining in this is that at least he's learning it now. I, I laugh. I say, honey, mommy didn't learn it until she was 40. <laughs> so, being that you're 13 and have, you know, parents who understand this and that you're going through this now, like I, I'm able to work with it. No, that's so true. Mindset is seriously everything. Like you define whether life is happening to you or for you. And once you decide life is happening for you, it's easier to manifest the things that you want in life. And that's been really big for me. Like I've gone through a huge transformation since, I mean, we're all not ourselves in high school, but in particular in high school and like early college, I mean, I guess it's like the closest thing I can compare it to because I'm 22, but I just like, I was not the same person that I am now. I don't think I had embodied myself. And I did think like, I'm not talented enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. And that like perpetuated thought pattern, the negative thought pattern of feeling not good enough, like Mm. in my life, like what you think of yourself is going to reflect in how others treat you. Like how you treat yourself is going to reflect how others treat you. And so deciding to like take the onus on myself to create my own reality and be really positive and be the best self I can be and recognizing in moments where things are hard or I'm getting rejected. Or even if you're like, have you ever been in one of those days where you're like waiting to hear back about a lot of things? Mm -hmm. So you're like checking your inbox a lot of times or, you know, you're like giving your energy to other people. Yeah. Um, being able to like take a step back and being like, well, in what ways am I like waiting on myself? In what ways do I need something for myself that I'm not giving myself and making it all very self-reflective and that's just the best way that I've taken charge of my reality and what I've been able to create. What do you attribute to that that you were able to change your mindset like that? I mean because you went through a difficult time with your you know with your previous partner. Yeah well I mean even just like when I was in high school when I had this like sh- mindset shift it was my senior year that was because of meditation mm. and a lot of energy work um, so that was good just to, like get out of my own head once yeah. a week two hours and just like begin to look at things differently. Um, and that really served me immeasurably for the years after. And then as far as like with the first business failure, I mean, it did get me down for a while. Yeah, it did. Like there's no way around that. And, um, I didn't turn back to meditation necessarily. It's more just like I waited until the next step percolated for me when I was like, Mm -hmm. what am I supposed to do next? And I really am about being intuitive listening to yourself, like knowing when it's the right time to strike, Mm -hmm. pushing myself. Like, I think I'm, I call myself a little hustler. Like we all like say the hustle, but like, I really try to hustle. Like I try to just like work my way through work really, really hard through any of the times that I'm feeling stressed out or not good enough or whatever it is. And Mm -hmm. in this I was like, you know what, this is, I like, I was made for more. I'm going to redefine myself and yeah, take this as just like a badge of honor right. like my story and use that story to help other people. Cause otherwise like, what was the use? And am I going to like let my life end when I'm 22 years old because <laughs> of my one experience? Like, no. So a lot of those things, you've got to give yourself time for the, the messages to come up or are you free to feel that sense of motivation again? And but, looking at failure as a learning experience. That's what it, comes I mean, it always is. You learn so much. Mm-hmm. And I think 
when you eventually you look back, like you know, I'm so grateful now that that failure happened because look what I've you know, and I'm so much happier now than I was then. Like I thought I was at my happiest when I was running this company. That's not true because now yeah. I just feel so in tune with myself and what I'm doing in the world. And I would have never gotten here if it wasn't for that failure. Oh, so right. You can describe like positive or negative to mm-hmm. any of the experiences or things that happen to you. Like you don't know if no. something or bad when it happens, even if it appears to be good or bad from the outset. Well, there's a lot to be said for that because, you know, looking back in my own life, so many things that I wanted to happen and that I failed at, you're right. I look back like, thank God, I am so happy that I failed or that it didn't work out because something bigger and better was meant for me. Yeah. And that's so important to make yourself remember too in those moments where you are failing or something goes wrong or something doesn't turn out like you want, just like Mm -hmm. take a step back and see the bigger picture. Yeah. So you have, so as you mentioned, your your list of colleges that you're touring, which is incredible. How are you, you know, so how are you, um, how are your, your attendants? Like, you know, how are they responding to you? It's been really amazing. I mean, it's funny. I was actually writing like a reflective article about it last night, but when you talk to an audience, it's not like a one-on-one conversation. So people are usually, I guess like the crowd mentality, like the way they look at you when you're talking is like blank faces. And so my first talk, I'm like, oh my gosh, I am boring this crowd to tears. (laughs) It was really hard. Like there's always a few people who are just like really aggressive. So I like try to look at them for positive reinforcement, but the response afterwards, I was like, okay, I'm good. And that helps me every time. But yeah, yeah, I love it. Like, I think my favorite part about giving the talk is even actually the talk. It's like right afterwards when people are coming up to like, thank you and to ask questions. And yeah. yeah, it's just, it's been really awesome. And I also try to like offer help beyond the advice that I give in the talk. For example, <laughs> I gave my second talk at Harvard was in front of all these high school girls for this, um, like young women in business mm-hmm. conference. And a lot of them were applying to colleges. So I was talking about like personal branding and how it helps in colleges. And I offered to look at every single girl's essay, college essay, and edit it. And that's like 300 girls in the room. So it sounded crazy, but that resonated <laughs> so much with people. Well, I mean, like oh, literally only five of them have sent it to me. Like I had oh, okay. an undertaking, but I was like, I can do it. I can do it. Because not everybody's going to send it, but they will yeah. remember that like that speaker put their money where their mouth is and they actually do want me to succeed. And they're like help, here to help me take the steps. Because a lot of speaking is like, well, how are you going to engage them after the talk? Mm. Right? Yeah. Like, I want them to follow me in more ways than just follow me on Instagram. Like, yeah. right. <laughs> I want them to like buy my next book and like see me on my next tour, or, like invite me to come to their school. So you got to be creative about ways to do that. That that's very generous of you, though. <laughs> as well, yeah. it was a little crazy, but it turned out really fine. Like literally, I edited like five essays. So that was it. And that's interesting because that's true. I've heard other speakers speak where, you know, they offer different advice and it's like, all right, listen, here's my email. You can contact me. Yet such a small percentage of people actually take advantage of it. Yeah, nearly no one. And so you have to have like an actionable step that like Mm -hmm. really, you've got to just think people are self-interested, right? And like these girls in particular, this crowd, they really, really, really needed help on their college essays. Like they're obsessed (laughs) with colleges. And so I'm like, all right, well. This will do it. And you know, now I'm like made friends with those people. Like a lot of it I do. The best part about speaking is forming like real connections and friendships with the people who are in the audience. And so you're also involved with, let's see, the Next Generation Summit. Yes. Next so what is Summit. that? Yeah. So that's my full-time job. I'm the director of community for them. It's a community of over 5,000 young entrepreneurs. And we have an online community. We have events like the Next Gen Summit um, itself. It's like our flagship event every June in New York City. Smaller campus events. Had one in Philadelphia this year, Harvard last year. And it's really fun because that's how I meet like literally my whole network and all my new best friends because <laughs> it's just all of these really motivated people who have these companies and these podcasts and these initiatives. And my mm-hmm. real job as the director is to pair people together depending on what they need if somebody posts in the community and they're like, I'm looking for a graphic designer to design my logo. Like I know all the graphic designers who can help them. So it's really cool. I mean, really my job is just like to meet people and offer them support as best I can, which is my favorite thing to do. So, so it's kind of like a networking. Yeah, definitely. Definitely networking. Um, It's like, it's a global community. So it has the, the online component is important because people talk that way, but then it's activated through these in-person events. Okay. Okay. So what else is on the horizon for you? I mean, I guess just a book speaking tour right now. <laughs> I'm really speaking. I just, I'm really excited to see how that continues to blossom. Um, and I'm, I'm learning, you know, as I go along, like how do I get, 
how do I get in front of people? How do I continue this? Um, but I also think about my third book inevitably as the writer I am. So, um, little hint about the third book, it's going to be about like, how to use aspects of the feminine in business and taking mm -hmm. it from a more spiritual approach, like aspects of feminine as an in intuition and female creative energy. Um, something I've really been interested in for a long time and it seems kind of taboo, I guess, because okay. it is kind of like tied to my spirituality, but I also think it's really going to resonate with people in the right way and that I can write it in a way that's accessible to people who may observe other religions or may not fully agree with what I say or right. I don't know something. It's not that out there. Like everyone knows intuition, but like things like female creative energy, et cetera. Maybe I think, yeah, I, that, um, you know, with emotional intelligence, there's a lot. Spirituality is a huge component of it. And it's interesting how uncomfortable people can be about yeah. talking about it. And I'm not talking about one specific religion. I'm just saying like the whole realm, it could be the universe, you know, it could be nature, it could be God, however you want to label it. But it, it's really important in life. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I definitely agree. I just, I also think it helps whatever it is. I just want, when I get up in front of people or when I'm writing or whatever I contribute, I don't want it to be like everything else. I want it to really make people think about things differently, shake them up, change the energy of the space. And yeah, I think I can only do that by being like a hundred percent myself and not being worried about the content content I'm putting in at all. And if it will resonate, as long as I know it resonates with me, it'll resonate with other people. And that goes back to being authentic again. Yeah. A hundred percent. It was yeah. like always, the biggest task we have in this life is to be 100% ourselves. And that's much harder than it seems. Have you had anybody come up to you and like, you know, from your speaking engagements who have difficulties and are asking for your advice on how to get past them? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. All the time. Sometimes it's like funny because there's like a line of people. And so the person's like getting at things a little, like their difficulties in their life. And sometimes they're coming up crying and, mm -hmm. um, I'm like, I don't know if we can fully flesh this out. Like sometimes they talk in like riddles because it's not like they're going to give their whole life story. Yeah. <laughs> but one girl came up and she told me, she's like, I'm in an, um, I just got out of a physically abusive relationship mm. and um, your talk just changed everything for me. Mm. And it was part of entrepreneurship, but I think she like took it. I think people take what they need to from the talks. And so I think she took it more as like a call to answer the siren call for her own life and her mm -hmm. self agency in her own life as opposed to like in a business. But in that case, like I'm like, want to sit down with these people for like an yeah. hour of coffee and like help them and talk things through with them and inspire them. But you have like five minutes tops <laughs> before you have to move on to the next person. But yeah, I, all the time. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's such a great feeling to be able to know that you're inspiring somebody with your own Best feeling in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Course, so. Which is what keeps me move going, and I'm sure that's what keeps you going as well. Oh, it definitely does. Yes. It definitely does. Well, thank you so I love this chat with you. This is super fun. We should do it more often. <laughs> yeah, just to get up and say hi. <laughs> I hope to see you in Italy. Oh, I know, girl. I'll see you there. We'll plan a trip. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what else? So how can we find your schedule for your speaking tour? Um, so my website is under construction, but it'll be under HaleyHoffmanSmith.com. And okay. otherwise, you can just follow me on Instagram. Very active there. Is As it you, open? Like, are the speaking engagements open to anybody, or do you have to be a student at the school? Um, some of them are. Some of them are. That's a really vague, but I'll okay. put it on my schedule for 2019 when I release it, like which ones are open to the public. Okay.